game controllers have come a very long way since the first major ones in the late 1970s. And although there's probably more game controllers than is possible to list, we'd like to take a walk through the history of game controllers now. Hi folks, it's Falcon and today on Game Ranks, the evolution of video game controllers. We're going to start back in 1977 with the Atari joystick, the main controller for the Atari 2600. Now, there were other controllers that were manufactured for it, but this is the main line controller, and that's what we're going to try to focus on today. Officially called the Atari CX-10 joystick, this was a very simple 9-pin controller in which you had a joystick and a button. Now, it is by no means the first joystick or controller ever used, but it is the first digital controller, as the previous Apple II and IBM PC controllers were fully analog. Well, it is a far cry from the standard look of a game controller today. It is very much an establishment of a lot of the standards of a game controller. The joystick goes in four directions. The button does, you know, what a button does. These are conventions we still have today, albeit slightly more complex, which we will talk about when we get to more complex joysticks. In 1978, the Magnavox Odyssey was introduced, and it made a pretty significant improvement on that controller with its eight-directional joystick and single button, which was not unlike the Atari controller, however, obviously enabled more gameplay options. In 1979, the Intellivision looked to improve on these functions by adding a lot of extra stuff, putting a 12-button numeric keypad on it, 0 through 9, clear and enter, action buttons on the sides, two on the left for left-handed players, two on the right for right-handed, and a quote-unquote control disc that was actually just a 16-direction directional pad. This is a game controller that isn't really well liked. It looks kind of like a TV controller and a numeric keypad and a silver circle combined into one thing, and it doesn't handle a lot better than that. I've held one of these before and it's beyond awkward, but it bears mentioning on account it acknowledged the need for the ability to do more. More buttons, more directions, etc. In 1980, the ColecoVision basically opted to do the same thing by expanding upon what was done with that controller, making a slightly better version of kind of a bad controller. The improvements were that the joystick was a little nicer. Well, that does make it less odd. It doesn't make it great. It's still kind of a bad design. But it's not as if this didn't influence controllers going forward. Obviously, having more buttons and more inputs is an important thing going forward in how games became more complex. 1982's Atari 5200 controller basically more or less tries to make this into a cooler concept with a more Atari-like joystick, a slightly more rugged construction, and more buttons. But it was still kind of a weird controller and these sort of weird controllers that were acknowledging the need to make games more complex and more interesting were also the main controllers when the entire gaming industry collapsed. The need to make games into something more, I think, functions as a bit of the manifestation of fear of the industry tanking. Some people had to know that was coming and wanted to try to make games bigger and better. Unfortunately, those controllers, while they did certainly acknowledge that need and influence later controllers in saying, hey, it's got to be more than just a single button, it still tanked. In 1983, interestingly enough, as the video game industry was literally in shambles, Nintendo saw an opportunity. Part of taking advantage of that opportunity was designing a controller that did the things that the Intellivision and Atari controllers specifically acknowledged needed to happen, but also simplified it in a manner that was palatable and enjoyable. The result was 1983's Nintendo Controller. Now, this was a controller that was seen on both the NES and the Super Famicom in Japan, but functionally, they're about the same. The Japanese one had a microphone input, but that's not terribly important as it wasn't a really widely used feature. The things that are important is that instead of a joystick, a D-pad, a cross that ostensibly allowed for four directions, however, was perfectly capable of handling eight directions, as was evidenced in quite a few games, was accompanied with a select button, a start button, an A button, and a B button, giving more functionality, but not so much more that, in theory, you would have to learn some kind of a weird number sequence, or at least whatever was implied by the number pad joysticks of the previous years. 
In 1986, Sega introduced their Master System, which had a controller very similar to the Nintendo controller. However, instead of a plus, it had a square to say, oh, hey, eight directions. Coming out of that square were several lines, making sure that you knew it could be pressed in diagonal directions, which was not a feature that the NES didn't have, it just used the plus thing. They wanted to try to look better. Although the Sega controller did not have a start and select button on it. In theory, that makes the controller actually a little bit less complex than the NES controller. But in 1988, Sega Genesis, also called Mega Drive and other territories, was released with a controller that, instead of two buttons, had three, which in theory allowed for a lot more combinations of movement. It also had a slightly edgier design. But perhaps one of the more influential ones on controllers today, it's kind of the first time you see that curved side along with some sort of downward sloping of any kind. It eventually got a six button variant that became very popular too. In 1990, when Super Nintendo came out, its controller took some design cues from the Sega Genesis controller. It was curved on the sides and sort of sloped downward itself, but it went ahead and added a few more things as well. On the controller face, it had a start select, and instead of two buttons as the NES had and three buttons as the Genesis had, it had four buttons, A, B, X, and Y. And on top, it added shoulder buttons, an L and an R button, that I would say is a vital addition to video game controllers that we see variations on in basically all modern controllers. In fact, the SNES controller, I would say, is the most similar to controllers now. The shape of the controller was so popular that the Gravis Gamepad, a PC controller, more or less tried to be that. It came out a year after the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in 1991, and became pretty standard for anybody who wanted to use a gamepad on the PC. Now, we're not going to go into massive detail on PC gamepads, as it's entirely a third-party game, there is no official PC controller, so I've brought this up because I will mention a couple of PC controllers, however, kind of in the context of the way I've mentioned the Gravis gamepad here. In 1994, the Sony PlayStation came out in Japan, and being its origins were a CD accessory for the Super Nintendo, it's not hard to imagine why its controller looks a lot like the Super Nintendo controller, albeit with a few differences. Instead of A, B, X, and Y, it's X, circle, square, and triangle. And instead of just two shoulder buttons, we get shoulder buttons and triggers. I'm thinking that Sony also probably thought about the Sega Genesis controller, the fact that it went further down kind of created its own grip. They specifically incorporated larger grips into the design of the controller, which is another vital component in modern video game controller design. The PlayStation grips essentially changed the way you held a game controller and, in my opinion, make controllers significantly more comfortable. 1994's Sega Saturn continued the evolution of the Sega game controller, actually having different controllers in the US and Japan, not fundamentally different, but I would say that the Japanese controller, although I've never held it, looks a little bit better. Both, however, are an obvious evolution of the controller that the Sega Genesis used, with six buttons and the addition of shoulder buttons. Both controllers kind of functioned to have grips, but not to the extent that the PlayStation did. And in the following year, 1995, Microsoft tried to replicate, I think, kind of all of these controllers at once with the Microsoft Sidewinder gamepad. It had six buttons like the Saturn controller, however it had grips that were a lot more like the PlayStation controller. It was a lot more curvy like the Super Nintendo controller, and although it really didn't make a massive splash, I owned one, and if anything, it kind of represented that to Microsoft, something was going to have to be done in the gaming space. More on that later. In 1996, the Nintendo 64 came out, which is a very interesting controller indeed. Looking at it directly, it has an M shape, a D-pad, an analog stick on the middle grip, an A button, a B button, four C buttons, shoulder buttons, and a Z trigger. The same year, Sega Saturn saw rising competition and realized they need to do something that was going to compete with it. They adapted their six button controller to a large circle with two grips and an analog stick. Now the D-pad and the analog stick are reversed from how we would use them today on a gamepad, but Sega was betting people would probably not like the idea of three grips 
that you would have to move your hand and hold it differently to use the analog stick. And I'm thinking they were probably right in the long run. However, there wasn't really a lot of games that used the analog stick on the Sega Saturn, but I think this was a contribution that was an interesting sort of view into the future, that when we combine the developments in the Nintendo 64 and the Sega Saturn analog controller, we can kind of see where things were headed. In Japan in 1997, the PlayStation DualShock controller launched, and that's pretty much the thing that we know today as more or less a standard controller. We run with a couple of standard controllers right now, and that's one of them. The addition of two analog sticks to the PlayStation standard layout basically enabled any game that we play today to be played with that controller, more or less. Obviously, there are some developments that we'll have to talk about later, but most first-person shooters could be played on that controller today, if you think about it. In 1998, the Sega Dreamcast launched in Japan with a sort of advanced version of the Sega Saturn controller we had mentioned a moment ago, but I think Sony noted that the Saturn controller's accessibility of the analog stick and D-pad from one single position, and the Nintendo 64's popularity of having more or less a similar design, however with three grips, kind of preempted the Dreamcast's controller with their DualShock, and by that time it kind of felt outdated. It did, however, have one cool addition, the VMU unit, which was a screen on the controller, as well as a memory card. In the year 2000, not only did the world end, or at least everyone thought it was going to, but the PlayStation 2 began, and with it came the DualShock 2. It's really not a lot different, in fact, Cosmetically speaking, it's nearly the same as the original DualShock. However, the square, circle, triangle, and X buttons are pressure sensitive. An example of how this works was in Grand Theft Auto 3, you could lightly press a button and you would drive slowly. Of course, no one did this. In 2001, Nintendo's GameCube came out, and you can see its PlayStation influence plain as day, but a little bit less apparent is the Dreamcast and Sega Saturn influence. The analog stick on the GameCube controller is almost identical in placement to the Sega Saturn's 3D controller and the Dreamcast's controller. It, however, adds a second analog stick, which replaces the C buttons, as well as makes the button placement of the A, B, Y, and X buttons more than slightly different. Also in 2001, the original Xbox launched, and the Sega influence was strong. In every way, it was kind of like a really big, bizarre Dreamcast slash Sega Saturn 3D controller. It had six buttons, it had two analog sticks, more like the GameCube controller, but the placement of the stick was Sega style rather than the Sony style of both the sticks being in the inner area of the controller. This is a design cue that Sega had its own kind of small win even though they lost and went out of the console business in that the Xbox is still doing this to this day. In 2002, Nintendo released the Wavebird RF controller, which was the very first wireless controller that didn't suck. It used RF frequencies, and it's notable for simply working. Instead of having to have a line of sight, it simply transmitted a radio signal which was picked up by a receiver and it worked. And it was great. Seriously, it was awesome. Also in 2002, Microsoft dumped their original Xbox controller, the Duke, in favor of Controller S, which was originally designed exclusively for the Japanese market, where it was believed that people would want a smaller controller. However, as it turns out in the United States, people also wanted a smaller controller because the Duke was just silly. Controller S is more or less what we're used to from the Xbox brand now, and from this point forward, game controllers got a lot more iterative, as in it was a slower, more fine-tuning oriented process in the evolution of controllers. The Xbox 360 came out in 2005. The controller itself is not a lot different from Controller S, although it also had good wireless capabilities. Now, it's important to keep in mind not every single Xbox 360 controller was wireless. However, it was really nice to have wireless controllers that were good. Again, thanks Nintendo for the Wavebird. Now, it's important to make a couple of quick notes on the Xbox 360 controller, however. The USB version of it basically became the best gamepad available on PC, at least by a lot of people's opinions, mine included. It's super easy to use on a PC, you simply plug it in and that's it. The wireless variant of the controller, however, didn't use RF signals in the same way 
way that the WaveBird did, it used official Bluetooth signals, making it the first mass-produced console controller to use that. Sony went the same route with its six-axis controller. However, early with the PlayStation 3, the six-axis, the official controller released at launch, didn't have haptic feedback, that is, rumble capability. Aside from Bluetooth, this was the main difference between the DualShock 2, as well as the addition of motion sensing capabilities. Again, that was why it was called six axis. It had six axes to rotate on, apparently. And not much later, they came out with the DualShock 3, which had the haptic feedback and all of the Bluetooth and motion sensing features of the six axis. This was, however, the third console generation where the controller for Sony's console seemed more or less the same, and the Xbox 360 controller was just a little bit more comfortable. In 2006, Nintendo released the Wii and with it the Wii Mote. The Wii Mote's a very interesting controller as it not only has an accelerometer in it, but it also has an optical sensor so that it can tell not only when you're moving it, but exactly where you're pointing it. This allowed for a lot of very interesting gameplay mechanics that were sometimes a little bit overused in Wii titles. It tended to be that first party titles got them right and third party titles didn't. However, that doesn't mean it wasn't a really interesting concept because it absolutely was. Similarly, in 2012, the Nintendo Wii U came out, and although nobody really understood what the hell it was, its controller is kind of the proto-Nintendo Switch. And yeah, the controller with its touchscreen and layout is basically the Nintendo Switch. However, it could only really be used to wirelessly play games with the Wii U in the house from a distance of something like 30 feet, making it not really a handheld and the novel elements of it not really that novel. Do you really want a portable that you're restricted to your own house with? Still, the innovation is very clear as the Nintendo Switch is very clearly a descendant of this. The Xbox One released in 2003 13, and this is, like I said, where the controller starts to get very iterative. It's more or less basically the same as the Xbox 360 controller, and it's basically exactly what it needs to be. It's a great controller. The Xbox One controller, honestly, is at a point where I don't know what you would do to make it better unless they added something that games suddenly required. Similarly, the PlayStation 4 controller, which released the same year, takes the many years of DualShock and says, well, how do we make the DualShock much more ergonomic and comfortable? In the mid-90s, it was certainly probably one of the more comfortable controllers, but it's not the mid-90s anymore, it's 2013. So they made it a little bigger, a little softer, and it feels overall pretty damn good. It also added a touchpad, which isn't really that useful, but the effort is appreciated as it could have been useful, it just nobody ended up really using it for a lot. And although the Xbox One, Xbox 360, etc. That controller is basically the best PC controller. I do want to quickly mention that in 2015, the Steam controller came out. And although it didn't necessarily take hold in the way I think they wanted it to, as they implemented two large touchpads on it, which take up too much room and make the placement of the ABXY buttons odd, as well as make the buttons themselves a little too small. It's a cool concept, and I wanted to mention it specifically because of that, but because of the way it's put together, it's kind of awkward for almost any type of game that requires two joysticks. Inevitably, the second joystick was a touchpad and never automatically returned to dead center, and that's weird. It is a cool looking controller though, and that's another reason that I wanted to mention it, because it, it, it is, it's a cool looking controller. It's kind of light and kind of cheap feeling, but I mean, they had a lot of good ideas that just didn't pan out with it, really. And the very final controller we're going to talk about in our evolution today is 2017's Nintendo Switch. Now, Nintendo Switch is such an interesting thing because the way the Joy-Cons work, they're kind of part of it. The Nintendo Switch is its own controller as it's a touchscreen and the Joy-Cons are attached to it by default. However, you can remove the Joy-Cons and play with them as motion sensing kind of pseudo Wii remotes. But you can also lock them on to the Joy-Con controller grip, which basically makes them a traditional controller. For games that require less buttons, you're able to use one of the Joy-Cons in order to enable multiple players to 
partake in the game without having more Joy-Cons. Mario Kart is a good example of this working, and you can even buy little controller grips to put the Joy-Cons into that make Mario Kart very enjoyable. And with that, we have three controllers that are relatively similar and yet all have their own sort of intricate little things about them that differentiate them. Between Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft, we kind of see three different versions of a merging of a lot of disparate ideas that came out over the last three decades. And honestly, I think that's pretty cool. You can pretty much pick up any of these controllers and know what you're doing in the game now. And it wasn't like that in the late 70s and early 80s. And that's kind of a testament to how far we've came. A local game store let us borrow a lot of the controllers we used in this video, so I wanted to give them a brief shout out at the end. So a huge shout out to our friends at East End Gaming in Oakdale, Long Island, New York. They gave us a hand with some of the controllers you saw in the video, and we really appreciate it. It was really awesome with them. And if you happen to be in that area, make sure you stop in and say hi. What's your favorite controller? It can be present or in the past. Leave us a comment, let us know what you think, and if you like this video, please click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week, and the best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe, and don't forget to click the notification bell. As always, thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero, and we'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.